Good morning. Um, you know, it's just so great to see uh, New York is back with conferences, right? I really missed it for the last two years. Um, my name is Abhijit, and uh, I lead the Center for Machine Learning at Capital One. Uh, I've been in this role for uh, about a year. Uh, before that, I was uh, with Facebook AI uh, for three years, built a lot of the engineering teams for uh, FAIR, Facebook AI research. Um, um, what I will talk about is one of the most important aspects of scaling ML and AI uh, within large organizations. And this is really, I would say, the differentiator between companies that will win in AI versus companies that are just going to be doing OK. Um, before I go into um, the, the AI and ML and ML ops, I just wanted to give you a quick intro to uh, Capital One, especially the data transformation, because it's really important to talk about data uh, when you talk about ML or ML ops. Um, about four years ago, uh, we decided to go all in on AWS. We didn't even talk about, like we did a you know, review of all the cloud vendors, and we just said single cloud, AWS, 100% all in. That just triggered a huge transformation in the company. Um, we exited our last data center uh, about a year ago. When I interviewed, you know, back in 2020, uh, June or something, uh, they told me we are the only large financial institution in this country that is like 100% on AWS. And I didn't believe them. Like, how, how can you run a bank? You know, just to, just to think about like, when you are swiping your card or you're doing an online transaction, um, you know, we have a huge number of fraud models that need to trigger uh, all kinds of decisions. And, you know, like we call this a decisioning uh, infrastructure. It's not just the models, it's the scores, the decision rules. You know, we do model overlays, like things that run on top of the model. Uh, we have a lot of features that get triggered in real time, a lot of streaming calculations that need to happen on the back end as you are seeing through the transactions and merchant locations. Um, how can you do that in 8 to 10 milliseconds on AWS, right? And, you know, a lot of our stuff need to be logged because of regulations, and I'm going to talk about some of that today um, as part of MLOps. Uh, but having been with the company for one year, I, I see that we are probably one of the most advanced, you know, um, certainly financial companies, but even if you compare like other industries, uh, to the extent we have embraced data and cloud and particularly AWS. Um, why is that important? Because most companies fail in ML um, to productionize ML because their data is not in good shape, right? That's like the, the table stakes for ML. Um, I feel really fortunate that I arrived, um, you know, after the data transformation happened because it is painful for no matter which company you work for. I have worked at Google and Facebook. Anytime you touch data and you need to clean that up, scale that up, you know, it's a multi-year journey. Um, but now, um, about a couple of years ago, they decided uh, that, OK, we are kind of done with data. Uh, how do we now make the company more real-time and intelligent? Um, so that's when our machine learning journey started. So uh, I'm going to uh, start with a couple of slides from, you know, um, that kind of gives you the scope of the problem. Uh, this is a, a paper that Google published a few years ago, uh, Hidden Technical Date in Machine Learning Systems, and I am almost feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. Basically, most machine learning systems, you know, the, the black box in the middle is the actual modeling code. This is where you write your features, you know, uh, build a model, do some test and validations, um, uh, do hyperparameter tuning, and then you're kind of done, right? Now you have to take that model and put it in production. 
All the other boxes, you know, and those are much bigger boxes, meaning like they have a lot more work. Uh, those are needed to actually deploy the model in production or even to build the model in development that will be truly, you know, kind of like representative of the data in production. So that's the challenge, right? The box in the middle, you know, it's an, the actual machine learning is probably not a huge task. And, and that is true for every company. These days you can spin up a cluster on Amazon and with SageMaker, you can actually build a model. But everything else, you know, uh, that's the hard part and that's what MLOps is. Uh, this is another slide from uh, Google Cloud. Uh, uh, it, it shows you um, the different stages of building a model. So for example, you have to extract some data, you have to prep the data, you have to do model training, model evaluation, you have it model trained, and now there is this dotted line, there is a magical process that takes that model that you just trained in your development environment, you want to drop it into your production environment, retrain the model, you know, create the scores or train the features, and then the model starts run, you know, serving. So you have you know, downstream systems like a prediction service. Um, maybe it's the, our, our fraud system, right? It sees a transaction, passes on the user ID, the merchant ID, the, you know, all kinds of other information, and the model returns uh, fraud or not. Um, so the dotted line is actually, I, in the last one year, you know, um, I, what I have come to appreciate is that compared to a tech stack, like a tech company stack, the dotted line is actually very complex in, in financial industry. And I'm gonna show you what happens through that dotted line that we have to do. Uh, within a regulated financial industry um, to push the model from development to, to, um, to production. So the other thing I would say is that um, with COVID, we have realized that uh, we have to change, uh, and I'm talking about you know, financial industry, we have to change some of the things that we do. So for example, um, a lot of our credit and fraud models um, are kind of build once and use forever. And I don't mean like use forever, meaning like really forever. But often credit models in, in, you know, in large banks get updated you know, once, in a, once a year, once in 18 months. But, and fraud models are usually daily and monthly. Um, many companies actually, they do it monthly. Um, we, we, you know, we, we are much faster than that, but even then, um, when COVID, you know, the lockdown happened, um, most of the transactions actually went from brick and mortar to online. Uh, there was a lot of online fraud uh, from, you know, um, people setting up fake web pages for masks and to all the way to PPP, you know, payments, fraud. A lot of that happened in digital world, right? So our models and the distribution of the data that they, that they were trained for was no longer valid. And we didn't even have a lot of the data, um, you know, that you really need from a lot of these new online sources of, you know, transactions, right? Um, so we realized that we need to have constantly updated internal, external, and third-party data sources with real-time data checks. Um, I mean, the traditional way, you know, we solved along with other financial companies is to create model, something called model overlays. So you keep the fraud model or you keep the credit model that you already have based on, you know, last 10 years of data. But then based on the real time data that's coming in, you create an overlay uh, over the model scores. You create specific clusters or segments of customers or, you know, whatever, like credit scores and then you update the model score for specific segments. So for example, you know, if you receive the PVP loan, you know, maybe you're not gonna default um, as fast as somebody else. Um, so, but that's not a good solution for the next, you know, uh, unknown like Black Swan event that happens, right? Um, 
and then we also realize that uh, we have to do like a lot of automation of our ML ops to similar to you know uh, what you see within Google or Facebook or other you know Amazon type environment, and then really monitoring. Um, even now, a lot of companies monitoring is um, kind of manual. So we want to monitor models. Like we want to build monitoring as part of deploying a model in production. So what makes it really uh, challenging for financial ML ops? So um, all this time, you know, we have been doing governance and model progression. By progression, I mean taking a model that was developed in um, you know, in a development environment and putting it into production, that, that's called this progression. We only had to deal with two types of models, material models and immaterial models. Material models are those that introduces some credit risk for us. You know, for example, a credit risk model, um, you know, when you apply for a credit card loan, a credit card, you know, there is a model that, that decides the, how much credit you're gonna have and whether it's approved or not. So those are material models. If we, if we build a bad model, that can put, a, put us in a lot of risk. So often you see a lot of the progression pipelines basically say material model, I'm going to do a bunch of checks. Immaterial model, I'm just going to let it go. Uh, or, you know, a much smaller number of checks. What we are actually building now is a much more rigorous way of doing model progression uh, along multiple dimensions. Um, and then this fine level granularity is actually helping us now to really you know, be like thoughtful about which models are progressed in which manner. So for example, we have models, we have features, we have reports, you know, uh, monitoring jobs, ETLs, um, that get pushed into production through the same pipeline now. But they have different checks, depending on the type of, you know, um, thing, artifact that we are pushing to production. As you know, there are lots of different languages for building a model. Often you will see in the same, you know, uh, GitHub repo that you are progressing from development to production, you may have a Scala Spark uh, pipeline for data processing, creating all the features, and then you know a Python, Scikit-Learn, PyTorch uh, for the actual modeling code. Um, as I said, you know, even in the materiality, like you know, how risky the, how much risk we we're going to have from that model, we are now much more granular, like high, medium, low, instead of just just you know a binary flag. Uh, and then so on and so forth. Like there are a whole bunch of things, even regional consideration. Like if you are pushing things to Europe versus in California, you know, GCPA is the, uh, or the CCPA is the California recent like Privacy Act. Like you gotta, you know, like progress certain things. You gotta make some checks on the features. Are we satisfying the California local regional, you know, requirements for privacy or not? So as you can see, this thing can quickly multiply and blow up on you um, all these different combinations that are being pushed to production. But if you don't do this, you are running a lot of risk and governance issues in your ML ops, right? Because you would not know if somebody, one of your users, one of the data scientists pushed something and you know something wasn't checked here. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this slide, but the, the problem kind of looks like this. You have a bunch of uh, GitHub repos, uh, and again, this is a little bit of a technical view, uh, but you have a Jenkins pipeline and you may have some Python code, etc. cetera, um, and the colors are not showing up really well, but those red and green you know, boxes are type of checks you have to do in the progression, that dotted line that I said between development and uh, production. In a lot of companies, it actually looks like that, like the first one. It's, it's you know, a lot of different lanes. Uh, you don't know how it looks like. You probably don't have much control over it. Uh, you're kind of flying blind. What we have done is we have created a state machine. We have separated the governance tasks like, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll show you an, an example of that. 
uh, from the CICD steps, uh, so linting, you know, whitelisting, uh, uh, checking for licenses, checking for vulnerabilities in the code, um, and and the the two. So we have we now have two lanes, right? Uh, with a lot of gates in between. And there is a state machine now that sits in the middle that looks at all those combination of factors that I mentioned earlier and then properly routes the, the you know, invokes the right microservice to do the proper check. Um, and as, as we started working on that, we also realized that, you know, what happens upstream in the development land uh, that really, you know, is a big factor that influences that progression pipeline. So we started then looking upstream and working with our machine learning engineers and data scientists to say, okay, you have essentially four different steps in your process, you know, in terms of data selection, like variable and model selection, et cetera, and then outcomes and deployment. How can I work with you to create a whole bunch of SDKs and libraries that will then be almost exactly the same between development and, and production? And that really helps in the middle, right? Like the progression uh, stuff that I was mentioning, um, because it's the same code, same SDKs, written by engineers, but then extended by data scientists. But we can take the same code and then pretty much we know we have a lot of confidence, we don't have to rewrite the code uh, or do other things you know, uh, with it. So our new uh, environment, and this took us a year, quite frankly, like the, all of last year. Um, it looks like this, you have a build and train environment uh, where you, you know, explore data, build the model, and then you create this kind of a configuration file that gets pushed into our progression pipeline there is a bunch of governance specification depending on the type of model, type of analysis you are doing. Um, and then it automatically creates a progression checklist uh, based on you know, all of those things that I mentioned earlier. And then in the state machine, we have a task system that will do for governance, for example, is there a peer that's checking the, the code? Is there a risk officer, you know, that's gonna check the, all the documentation, all the, you know, uh, uh, privacy, like the fair lending is to check for privacy of the, the data elements. Um, um, the risk officer needs to check for not just the, the documentation, but things like, you know, it, it, did you do any analysis with the explainability of the model? Uh, did you do any kind of, you know, score, cutoff, uh, analysis and see if it, there is any bias, you know, for your whatever segments of customers, etc. Again, depending on the model. Uh, and then it automatically starts to check in the system um, how, you know, these approvals are coming in um, and then some of them are fully automated, like, you know, a lot of things in our CI CD part of the the gates, uh, those are like microservices, lint, build, um, you know, unit test. It just pushes the code, runs a bunch of things, and then returns, say, automatically checks it. Um, so by the time the model comes here, we have a lot of confidence um, in that model that, hey, um, we, uh, that we know that, you know, that model will pass the regulatory requirement for, um, for a bank. Uh, next, I'm gonna touch briefly on monitoring um, because this is another area we realize that uh, you have to invest in, uh, um, you know, if you're gonna scale machine learning uh, through the company. And there are lots of challenges. I'm not gonna go over them, uh, all of them, but typically, you know, uh, you will see that you push the model to production and then all of a sudden you have performance issues uh, with, with the model. And there can be, you know, data issues, there can be infrastructure issues. Like let's say you have a, um, uh, push the model to serving and all of a sudden you're not getting the right, you know, kind of the score. It could be an infrastructure issue, um, and then monitoring, you know, uh, integrating monitoring in every layer of your stack can pinpoint uh, what, what's the, you know, what, what is it causing that, 
uh, performance degradation. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, you know, uh, you are all familiar with concept drift, covariate shift, uh, and then data shift. Uh, just to, I, I'm not going to go over them, but uh, again, um, you know, um, there are so many ways uh, a model can behave poorly between development and production, or, and also after you have deployed in production. So again, in this case, you can think of creating microservices uh, that will check for those things and then bring all of them into a production dashboard. Uh, and you can think of um, you know, the progression pipeline that I mentioned earlier, that it actually drops a harness, uh, essentially creates a call to a backend monitoring platform uh, that will automatically start running once the model is pushed to production. Um, the other aspect I'm going to mention uh, is that when, you know, when, when I joined, there were literally four different machine learning platforms in the company. And they were bespoke platforms um, that are developed for very custom things, you know, for specific line of business applications. And one of the things that the team, the, the enterprise team was working on is to create a consistent way uh, to run Kubernetes clusters. And you know, for those of you who are on the infrastructure side of machine learning, you know a lot of places actually you need you know, Kubernetes to, to orchestrate the containers for machine learning, you know, whether training or data pipeline or even the progression pipeline, serving, you know, et cetera. So, you cannot just spin, you know, on AWS, uh, EKS, or uh, or even like EC2 instances, uh, if you are a regulated financial company, or I would say even in a large, you know, uh, company. Whatever infrastructure you use, it has to satisfy certain compliance and security, you know, uh, policies of the company. So what we did is we took the open source COPS and then created an enterprise version, and then that became kind of the lowest level infrastructure layer for all of these four disparate platforms in the company, and we started merging at the foundation layer. And I'll tell you, it was not easy. Uh, there are all kinds of things. I can probably spend the next you know, two, three hours to talk about like from organizational, from technical challenges, from converging, you know, um, like across different, you know, even with Kubernetes, like even with COPS, we had three different versions in the, you know, in the company. Uh, it was hard work on a lot of people's part, uh, but that really helped having a common infrastructure uh, of these platforms and then starting to build a central platform and then eventually starting to converge all of these things into the same stack. Uh, um, you know, um, that, that created that synergy. And then um, the other thing I'm going to mention is that um, in the last one year, what we have learned is that, you know, in any given company, there will be lots of local teams that are innovating on machine learning, infrastructure, on data, instead of saying there will be one solution that will win over the entire you know, company. We have a different philosophy. We say, if you have a great thing locally, how can I work with you to actually elevate that into the enterprise stack? Um, uh, you know, um, and, and then um, when we do that, we, you know, now that we have the common foundation you know, in place in most of these teams, it's actually much easier to go higher up in the stack rather than if we didn't have that, right? So that's a very important lesson we have learned. Um, the other thing we have done is that the teams should always document, train, evangelize uh, the new platforms and tools. Um, uh, we often provide like white glove service in some cases when we want a big pool of users to come onto enterprise platforms. And then uh, this is a real lesson in platform building platforms um, is that, uh, and I have learned this the hard way over many years, is that um, 
When you build a platform for a company, always think of like building it as almost like you're building an open source uh, platform. So the core of the platform, the basic interfaces, the foundational schemas, you know, should be done by a core team that can be central, or you, maybe you can bring them virtually as a central team, whichever works. But then rest of the platform, everything else that you do um, should be, people should be able to contribute. And you know, uh, the best example is PyTorch, right? There is PyTorch is maintained by Facebook, uh, but core of PyTorch, like the compiler, for example, but all the apps around it, you know, mostly written by other people. That's the, the, that's the direction we are now going with our ML platform now that we are over the hump. Um, we'll basically become an open source platform within Capital One and hopefully someday we might even open source it to the world. To the, to the world. That's it. Thank you.